everyone. Welcome back to Carrie's Corner. Frog's excited here because we are going to continue with one of Frog's favorite books, right, Frog? That's right. With The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, illustrated by Eric Kincaid. We're starting in the middle of the chapter Home Sweet Home. This is where we left off yesterday. And we will start today at the top of the page. Hang Riverbank and supper too, said the rat heartily. I tell you, I'm going to find this place now if I stayed out all night. So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and we'll very soon be back there again. Still snuffling, pleading, and reluctant, Mole let himself be dragged back along the road by his companion. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing that part of the road where the mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for some little way when suddenly the rat was conscious through his arm that was linked in moles of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down the animal's body. Instantly he disengaged himself, fell back a pace and waited all attention. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment rigid while his uplifted nose quivering slightly felt the air. Then a short quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow steady competent advance the rat, much excited, kept close to his heels as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived. But the rat was on the alert and promptly followed him down the tunnel to which his nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless and the earthy smell was strong and it seemed a long time to rat before the passage ended and he could stand up and stretch and shake himself. The mole struck a match, and by its light the rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was Mole's little front door with Mole End painted in Gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it, and the rat, looking around him, saw that they were in sort of a forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door and on the other a roller. For the mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statues. Down one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley with benches along it and a little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish and surrounded by a cockle shell border. Out of the center of the pond rose a fanciful ornament clothed in more cockle shells and topped by a large silver glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him and he hurried rat right through the door little lamp in the hall and took one glance round his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless deserted look of the long neglected home and its modest size, its worn and shabby contents and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose in his paws. Oh, Ratty, he cried dismally. Why did I ever do it? Why did I bring you to this poor cold little place? On a night like this, when you might have been at Riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire with all your nice things about you. The rat paid no attention. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, and lighting lamps and candles, and sticking them up everywhere. What a cackle of little house this is, he called out cheerily. So compact, so well planned, everything here and everything in its place. We'll make a fine night of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlor. Splendid. Your own idea. Those little sleeping bunks in the wall. Capital. Now, I'll fetch the wood and the coals and you get a duster mole and you'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table and try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his companion, the mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and hardiness while the rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He called the mole to come and warm himself, but mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in his duster. Rat, he moaned. How about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? 
I've got nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser. Quite distinctly, and everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere. Come on, pull yourself together and let's look around. So they went hunting through every cupboard and turned out every drawer. The result was not so very depressing after all, though of course it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of Captain's biscuits nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. There's a banquet for you, observed the rat as he arranged the table. I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight. No bread, groaned the mole. No butter. No, no pas de foie gras, no champagne, continued the rat grinning. And that reminds me, what's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course, every luxury in this house. Just you wait a minute. He made for the cellar door and presently reappeared somewhat dusty with a bottle of beer in each paw and another under each arm. self and dudgeon beggar you seem to be, Mole, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the nicest little place I was ever in. Now, wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so home like they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it and how you came to make it what it is. Then, while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks, and mustard, which he mixed in an egg cup. The mole related, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, how this was planned, and how that was thought out, and how this was got through a windfall from his aunt, and that was a wonderful find and a bargain, and this other thing was bought with hard-earned savings and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally restored. He had to go and touch his possessions and take a lamp and show their points to his visitor and tell them all about them quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed. Rat, who was desperately hungry, but tr tried to conceal it, nodded seriously, examining with a puckered brow and saying, wonderful and a most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given him. At last the rat succeeded in luring him to the table and had just got seriously to work with a sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt outside. Sounds like the scuffling of small feet on the gravel and a confused murmur of tiny voices while broken sentences reached them. Now, all in a line, move the lantern up a bit, Tommy, dear. Clear your throat first. <coughs> no coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill? How? Here, come on. Do what we're all awaiting. What's up? asked the rat. I think it must be the field mice, replied the mole with a touch of pride in his manner. They go around carol singing regularly at this time of year, and they never pass me over. They come to Mole End last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks and supper too sometimes when I could afford it. It will be like old times to hear them again. Well, let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red woolly scarves round their necks, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jiggling for warmth. With bright, beady eyes, they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little, sniffing and using their coat sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now, one, two, three. And right away, their shrill little voices arose, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers had composed and handed down to be sung at Yule time. Here they are waiting to sing in all the other pictures. And I'm now going to make up the tune. Villagers, all this frosty tide, let your door swing open wide. Though the wind may follow and snow beside, yet draw us in by your fire to buy. Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in the cold and sleep, blowing fingers and stamping feet. Come from far away you to greet, you by the fire and we in the street. Bidding you joy in the morning, for ere one half of the night was gone, sudden a star had led us on, raining bliss and bend the sun, bless tomorrow and more anon, joy for every morning. The voices stopped, the singers, shy but smiling, looked at each other, and silence fell, but for a moment only. Then from up above and far away came the sound of distant bells ringing loud and joyful peal. Very well sung, boys, cried the rat heartily, and now come along in, all of you, and warm yourselves by the fire, and have something hot. Yes, come along, field mice, cried the mole eagerly. 
This is quite like old times. Shut the door after you. Pull up that seat to the fire. Now you just wait a minute while we... Oh, ratty, he cried in despair, plumping down on his seat. There he is inviting them in. Oh, ratty, close to tears. Whatever are we doing with nothing to give them? You leave that all to me, said the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern, come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now, tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. At this time of year, our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, and get me here much muttered conversation took place. And the mole only heard bits of it, such as fresh mind. No, a pound of that will do. See, you get buggins, for I won't have any other. No, only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Yes, of course, homemade. No tin stuff. Well, then, do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the seat, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of the fire and toasted their toes till they tingled. While the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out caroling this year. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now, we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater into the red heart of the fire. And soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting that he'd ever been cold in all his life. The act plays to these fellows, the mole explained to the rat. Make them up all by themselves and act them afterwards. And very well they do it too. They gave us a capital one last year about a field mouse who was captured at sea by a pirate and made to row in a galley. And when he escaped and got home, his lady love had gone into a convent. Here, you, you were in it. I remember, get up and recite a bit. The field mouse got up on his legs, giggled slightly, looked around the room and remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on, come on. Mo coaxed and encouraged him, go on. And the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him, come on, man. But nothing could overcome his stage fright. Then the latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of the basket. There was no more talk of play acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out on the table. Under the generalship of rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw the board set thick with tasty treats, saw his little friend's faces brighten and beam as they fell to without delay, and then let himself loose, for he was famished indeed on the food so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times, and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date, and answered as well all they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing, only taking care that each guest had what he wanted and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or worry about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful and showering wishes of the season with their jacket pockets stuffed with presents for their small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew their chairs in, brew themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale and discuss the events of the long day. At last, the rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleep is simply not the word. That's your own bunk over there on that side? Very well, then, I'll take this. What a grand little house this is. Everything's so handy. There they are, including little mice in the corner sitting on the bench. Very cute. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets, and sleep soon carried him away. The weary mole also was glad to turn in without delay, and soon had his head on his pillow in great joy and contentment. But before he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight, 
He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it all was, but clearly too how much it all meant to him. He did not at all want to abandon the new life and its splendid spaces, to turn his back on sun and air and all they offered him and creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still, even down there, and he knew he must return to it. But it was good to think he had this to come back to, this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. And that brings us to the end of our story, chapter five of The Wind in the Willows. Here's the last page of what we just ended on. Stay tuned for our next chapter, chapter six called Mr. Toad, not frog, but toad, of Wind and the Willows. See you tomorrow, have a great rest of your day. I hope you finish your homework and have some time to play and read and maybe read a book aloud to someone. Thanks, see you tomorrow, bye-bye.